Good morning, Cross Point. Y'all stand, let's worship together.
Welcome to Crosspoint, you guys. It's such an honor to get to worship with you this morning, whether you're online, whether you're here. Just thank you for joining us today. Um, here at Crosspoint, our prayer is always to point people to Jesus and to inspire them to live a cross-shaped life. And we do that through serving and sending and through worship and discipleship. So before we jump back in um, to uh, the next song, I just want to invite you guys to turn to your neighbors. Just tell someone hello this morning. Let's just continue worshiping this morning. Lord, we love you. We honor you today. We give you our everything. You're the reason we're here, Jesus.
my confidence is your faithfulness. Oh, I will rest in promises. My confidence, oh yes, is in your faithfulness. Before you guys take a seat, I just want to invite you to celebrate with us because we get to baptize today. Come on, let's celebrate that. Well, hey, church family. I want to introduce you to my friend Zion this morning. Zion is having a really special day for two different reasons. One, obviously he's here to get baptized this morning, but also today is Zion's birthday. How awesome is that? And I'll tell you, we have had the best time up here. This little guy has about 101 questions about the funniest things ever. He was asking us about the water. I had tricked him and told him that it was cold. Uh, he was asking me if he could have a microphone. So he was really excited to be up here this morning. And uh, he's doing great with his job of smiling to all of you guys. But Zion went with us to summer camp. He's a sixth grader going into seventh grade. And uh, he went with us to summer camp. And during that time, during one of the night sessions, Zion made a decision to follow Christ. And so this morning he has come forward to be baptized and make a declaration of that inward change that has happened in his life. And so Zion, Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What is your profession of faith? Jesus is my Lord. Amen. Well, Zion, because of your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Church family, there's no greater joy than to see that take place. Would you give the Lord one more hand for a life that was changed? Listen, I have good news to report. We have a mission team right now in New Orleans. We uh, had the opportunity to pray of them last week. And uh, they are right now uh, getting ready for the day. They're going to church. They, I wrote a couple of things down. They, they have been to voodoo shops in uh, New Orleans and sh sharing the gospel. They have a community meal tonight. They have uh, cleaned out storm drains. Put yourself in that moment just for a moment. They've gotten down in the storm drains and they cleaned them out. They've been to laundromats and do, done ministry there. They have shared the gospel. They have had conversations. And today they get to worship with their church family there in New Orleans. And then this afternoon, you be praying for them as they have the opportunity simply to sit down with a bunch of people from the community and have a meal. And hopefully there will be many, many gospel conversations as a result of that today. It reminds me just a 
mission team like that, it reminds me of what Jesus said when two of his disciples were asking, hey, can I sit on the left or the right? And Jesus said this in Mark. He said, for even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus was the one who wanted to model with everything that he had, every breath that he had, that he was going to serve. And today in the lobby, we want to encourage you before you leave, on your way out, that you would simply take a moment and say, where can I serve? How can I serve? It's fun to be a pastor because I get to stand out there. And it's like many of you, uh, uh, people that have the opportunity to relive your high school days where you tried to run through the cones at recess as fast as you can. What I want to encourage you to do, would you just slow down and consider maybe there's somewhere here that you might be able to serve. In fact, when we sent that team off on Wednesday at 530 in the morning, two of our guys said, hey, listen, I want to help in the parking lot. It's amazing when you set your mind to the task of serving others, you see a trickle-down effect of everything in your life. And we want to encourage you today on your way out, would you consider where you might serve? You see, Jesus modeled that, and perhaps today you will follow in that leadership. Every time you give to our church, you are giving to people that serve week in and week out and to the ministry that takes place under their watch. Would you consider also giving of your tithes and your offerings today? There's a couple different ways you may give. You can see them on the screen. Perhaps if you're in the room, you can take part by giving here in the lobby. Or maybe if you're online, you can simply go onto the uh, number and the uh, website and just go through the app and you can give as well. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for a model of service that's in New Orleans even now. But Father, we thank you for the greatest model of service, and that is your son Jesus, who gave his life willingly that we might have the hope of life. And today, God, as we look at this idea of you continuing to to keep your promises through the life of Joseph and in Genesis chapter 47, we pray right now for Austin as he stands in this pulpit in our pastor's stead and simply opens the word that all may learn and grow. Father, we thank you for his preparation. We thank you for his testimony and his life of faithfulness. And we pray that, God, you would use him now to teach us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. I am really, really happy to be standing up here this morning. If you brought a copy of God's Word with you, you can go ahead and open it to Genesis chapter 47. That is going to be where we're going to spend the bulk of our time this morning. If you're really fast, sword drill this morning, you can go ahead and also open up to Joshua chapter 21. We're going to spend a couple of moments there. Uh, If you'd like to follow along with our sermon notes this morning, you can pull up our app click Sunday, click message notes in the top right, and we have already done all the work for you, and it's very easy for you to follow along with those. I want to thank our pastor for the opportunity uh, to stand up here and preach. Uh, Some of the highlights uh, of my time here at Crosspoint has been when I get to stand in front of the people that I've grown to love and talk about the God that I love. I'm thankful for our pastor for his investment in us young guys. He sent me an audio message this morning, praying for me early this morning. And I'm just really thankful for his encouragement and his constant investment in us. There's a well-known quote that many of you have heard. It says, a man is only as good as his promise. Basically, what, or a man is only as good as his word. What it's saying is, if you make a promise, keep it. So I wanna take you back to a story way back in 2001, where there was a time in my life where I did not keep a promise. All the way back in 2001, it may pain some of you older folks in the room to know that in 2001, I was five years old, not very old, Uh, but my family and I, my parents are sitting right down here, my family and I were at SeaWorld in Orlando, very great place. They took my sister and I to Shamu's Happy Harbor. I had to look up the name, didn't know what it was. It's no longer a part of SeaWorld, so you can't go tomorrow, but it used to be. And there was a playground, there's a picture right up here. There's a playground at Shamu's Happy Harbor that looked exactly like this. 
And so I, my sister and I have a twin sister. We're excited to go up into the playground. And right before we go up, my parents looked at me, big, strong, protective man that I was at five years old. And they said, it's very busy. Do not leave your sister. I rolled my eyes. Fine, whatever. I'll do it. I, I was excited to go. And not sensing my commitment to the task that they had given me, my mom leaned back over and she said, do you promise? And I said, yes, I promise. If you study literature, that is what we call foreshadowing, because uh, you're going to see why in just a second. We get up into the playground and there's an immediate crisis. Abby wants to go this way. I want to go this way. Me being in charge said, we're going this way. Doesn't matter what you think. Turned my head, expecting her to follow. I went. I made my rounds in the playground. I went down through the slide that you saw, went back up to my parents. I'm like, here I am. And they were like, where is your sister? And I was like, relax. She's right behind me. She was not right behind me. Uh, long story short, they shut the, that part of the park down for a little bit. Um, they ended up finding her still in the playground, all by herself, kind of scared. Uh, there was no harm done to her, but at that point, uh, the damage was done. I had broken my promise. And you know, why do we as humans have such a hard time keeping our words, such a hard time keeping our promises? It's not really a hard question to answer. We're sinful. We are selfish. We're stubborn. We want our own way. And so we change our minds, we go back on our words. As much as you may try, you will often find yourselves either breaking a promise or desiring to break a promise. The good news for you today is one of the great truths of the Bible is that God is not like us. Our God keeps his promises. And a very quick theology lesson for you, there are three traits that kind of factor into why we can know that God keeps his promise. Number one is what Ryan talked about two weeks ago is God's providence. God's providence is the fact that he loves and cares for you and his people deeply. Number two is his sovereignty. This is the fact that God not only loves and cares for you, but he is in complete charge. He has all power, all authority to do whatever he wants. Nothing's gonna stand in his way. And number three, buckle your seatbelts. Micah did that a couple weeks ago. I like that. Uh, is the fact that God is immutable. It's a big word. I know. All it means is that God does not change. So you put all those three things together and what you see is he loves and cares for you deeply. And so when God makes a promise to you, he will go to great lengths to keep it. He's all powerful. So he's able to keep the promises that he makes to you. And lastly, he's immutable. So we can rest assured today that when God makes a promise to us, he will not change his mind. There are four main sections in the passage that we have today. And those of you guys on staff know, I struggled for a couple of weeks. I, you know, what happens in the passage is very important. It's very important to the Bible. It's very important just in history in general. But I struggled with how do all four of these things flow together? It seems like kind of four important events that are spread out. And finally, after praying about it a lot, the light bulb kind of flicked on for me. When you zoom out of Genesis chapter 47, you begin to see that these four events that happen are all a part of the grand story of God keeping his promises to his people. So real quick, let's go back to what, what God mainly promised his people in the Old Testament. You find in Genesis chapter 12, you can look it up later, but God promises to Abraham, he says three things to you. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you land and I'm going to make you a great blessing. And a lot of what happens in the Old Testament is the people of Israel experiencing and God fleshing that out throughout their lives. Genesis chapter 15, a couple of chapters later, God then says to Abraham again, he says, hey, at some point, you and your people are going to be strangers, foreigners in a foreign land. You're gonna be afflicted, it's gonna be 400 years, it's gonna be a long time, but eventually, I am going to bring your people out and I'm going to take them to the land that I've promised to them. Now, all of this is very important to what we're gonna talk about today. Some of you have your finger stuck in Joshua chapter 21. Go ahead and open your Bible to that. And what we see here in Joshua chapter 21 is way past what we're gonna talk about today. Everything that we're going to talk about today is gonna to feed into this verse that we're about to read in Joshua. We talk all the time about the promised land that God is ultimately going to take his people to. This verse occurs right after 
God has given his people that promised land. And Joshua makes sure to write at the end of this book, he says in Joshua chapter 21, verse 45, he says, not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. See, church, that is a God that keeps his promises. Today, as we walk through the text of Genesis chapter 47, we're gonna see that all four events that we're gonna talk about are going to be a part of that verse in Joshua being true. Our main point for today, if you are taking notes, is that God is faithful to keep his promises. So let's look at the text over the next couple of minutes of Genesis 47 to find four ways that our promise-keeping God cares for his people. Point number one, the promise-keeping God directs his people. Micah did a fantastic job, I thought, last week explaining the, the reunion of Jacob and Joseph, this spectacular reunion, and right where Micah left off, we were going to pick up this morning. So if you look at the tail end of Genesis chapter 46, we're going to start there. Verse 31 of Genesis chapter 46. Joseph said to his brothers, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and I'll say to him, my brothers and my fathers have come to me who are in the land of Canaan and the men are shepherds for they have been keepers of livestock and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? What is your job? What have you come here to do? Joseph tells his brothers to say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth even until now, both we and our fathers. Joseph says, I want you to say that in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Here's what's happening here. Joseph, right before they walk into the main stage where he's gonna talk, they're gonna talk to Pharaoh, Joseph is giving his brothers some pregame instructions. Have you ever given anybody pregame instructions to a talk that you're gonna have later on? Uh, it actually happened to me uh, way about three and a half, four years ago, before I, I came down to work at Crosspoint, uh, Mike, our executive pastor, was going to call me. He was going to see if I was interested in coming down. He was going to see if he was even interested in me coming down. And about five minutes before that scheduled call, Micah Ledford called me. Uh, he's our middle school pastor here. Micah and I were very close friends in college. We've been friends for a while. He called me. He said, hey, uh, I just wanted to prep you for the conversation. Just want to see if you're ready. I was like, yeah. He said, also wanted to prep you for Mike. And I was like, okay, like, who is this person? He said, well, he's awesome. He's an awesome leader. Uh, he's funny, uh, but he's real unique. And so he's going to go about this conversation in a weird way. He said, just hang with it. You'll be fine. I said, okay. I don't know. I don't know if I want to answer the phone. I did. Uh, though you can ask me later on how that conversation went. It was very funny. Uh, but it's funny how throughout the years now, us younger guys now tell other people like, hey, just to let you know, Mike is awesome, he's unique. So you gotta give these pregame instructions. And that is what Joseph is doing to his brothers. He's like, hey, I know exactly how this conversation is gonna go. Pharaoh is going to ask this question and here is what you're going to say back to Pharaoh. So let's see in verse three of Genesis 47, let's see how the brothers do. Verse three. It says, Pharaoh said to the brothers, what is your occupation? Joseph was right, to the T. He knew exactly what jo uh, Pharaoh was gonna ask. And he tells them, or they tell him, we have come to sojourn in the land for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks. For the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. The brothers did pretty well. The pregame instructions worked. They said exactly what Joseph told him to say. They said, hey, we're shepherds. We've come to sojourn, which meant, hey, we're not coming to stay forever in your land. We're just coming for a period of time. So then Pharaoh turns to Joseph, who Pharaoh's known for a long time now. And let's see how Pharaoh responds. Verse five, he says, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen. And if you know any able men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. Pharaoh says, the best possible land that we have, give it to them. Let them settle in Goshen. Why is he going to let them settle in the best of the land? Why is he going to give them Goshen? Well, two reasons. One's very practical and it's kind of funny. When they are saying, hey, Pharaoh, we'd love to stay in Goshen, all of their stuff is already there. 
If you go back and you look at where Jacob and Joseph, Micah preached this last week, where Jacob and Joseph reunite, where Israel comes when they come into Egypt, it's in Goshen. So basically the, the brothers are saying to Pharaoh, hey, uh, we'd love, we'd love, we'd love, we'd love to stay in Goshen. By the way, all of our stuff's already set up there. I'm saying of like earlier today, like it would be really hard, it would be really easy if you went to a real estate agent, like, hey, I'd really love to buy that house. By the way, I already set all my stuff up in there. So that's what the brothers are saying. But of course we know that more importantly, Pharaoh is going to give them the best of the land because he had seen God's favor on Joseph and he wanted to honor Joseph's family. So why is Goshen so important? Why is Goshen so important? The point here is that the promise keeping God directs his people to where he wants them to go. So we know God is strategic, we know God is sovereign. Why is he going to give them Goshen? Let's look at a map here on the screen. You can see on the left side here in big block letters, you see Egypt. And what you see is up and to the right, in italicized letters where all of that water is, is Goshen. And it's very important, everyone look up here. What you see on that map is God is separating his people. He's separating his people. One author says, they will remain separate from the Egyptians, which separation God will use to preserve the distinctive characteristics of his people for his future plans. God is purposefully directing them to Goshen in order to separate them from the Egyptians. If you zoom out a little bit more and you think, why Goshen? Zoom ahead a little bit to the Exodus, the next book of the Bible, it's 400 years later, God is going to bring his people out of the land of Egypt. We know that he sends 10 plagues on the Egyptians. You've got flies, gnats, lice, diseased livestock, water turning to blood, boils, hail, darkness, uh, death of the firstborn. You've got 10 plagues and we read in scripture that at least five of them, it specifically says God sent that plague on the Egyptians and not on the Israelites. So now you start to see fleshed out why it is that God wanted to separate his people. If God just sent his people into the main city of Egypt and they lived amongst the Egyptians, he never could have sent a plague that only went to the Egyptians and not to the Israelites. So what we see here is that because God directed his people to Goshen and separated them from the Egyptians, he was able to protect them and he was able to continue to keep his promise to make them a great nation. So the question for you this morning, as you look in the mirror, is where has God placed you? Where is God directing you to go? What is God directing you to do? Some of you, Mike talked about the mission team that we have out, some of you, maybe God is directing you to go to the mission field. Some of you, probably a larger number, God is directing you to join a small group. Maybe he's directing you to go and hold a baby in our nursery every other Sunday. You've got an opportunity to sign up for that after the service. If you have not gone where God has directed you to go, and if you have not done what God is directing you to do, the simple application this morning is just go and do it. There is, I've never had a regret for doing anything that God wanted me to do, as uncomfortable as it may have made me feel. For those of you who are sitting here this morning, you're like, I'm exactly where God wants me to be. I'm doing, I think, what God wants me to do. The question for you is, are you content in that? And are you serving the Lord where you are? So after those Israelites settle in their new home, Joseph is going to take Jacob, his father, to see Pharaoh. And what we're gonna see here is not only does the promise keeping God direct his people, but also point number two, the promise keeping God empowers his people. Read with me, Genesis chapter 47 and verse seven. says, then Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and stood him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. So here we see Jacob standing before Pharaoh, and he's gonna bless him. Don't lose sight of what's happening here. Don't lose sight of the scene. We spent two summers talking about Pharaoh, so we hear his name. We're like, yeah, he's a normal guy now. Don't forget that Pharaoh is the most powerful man in charge of the most powerful nation on the earth. He's the king of Egypt. Most of the Egyptians would have viewed Pharaoh as a god. And here you have Jacob. He's weary, he's old, he's traveled. 
and he's a lowly shepherd. And yet when they come face to face, Jacob was bold. One author describes it this way. He says, the king of Egypt encountered the father of the promise and the promise bearer held court. See, Jacob was empowered to speak to Pharaoh because he believed God's promises to his grandfather, Abraham. So we see Jacob blesses Pharaoh. In fact, he blesses him twice. And we see kind of the outworking of one of God's promises to Abraham. Remember, he promised him in Genesis chapter 12, I will bless those who bless you and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. We literally see Jacob taking part in fulfilling that promise. We take a step back here. Was Jacob a superstar? You think God would send his, his best guy. You think he would have Joseph do this. Was Jacob a superstar of the faith? No. If you read the story of Genesis, actually, Jacob had a whole lot of ups, a whole lot of downs. In fact, he had a lot more downs than he had ups. But when God called on Jacob, Jacob trusted that God would empower him. Some of you may say this morning, I, I don't have what it takes. You know, God, you know, that's a Bible character. Like God's gonna call him, of course. And for some of you, you may say, I don't have what it takes. God hasn't equipped me to do anything for him. It's been said over and over and over again that God does not call those who are equipped. God equips those who are called. When God calls you to do something, he will equip and empower you to do it. One of the main jobs that we have here at our church is found in Ephesians chapter four, verse 13. It says to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That flips how a lot of people view church on its head. What that means is it is not just Cross Point's job to go out and do ministry. It's not just James Merritt's job to go out and do ministry on your behalf. What that verse means is that it is the church's job through God to help equip the people of the church to go out and do ministry. And that sounds like a daunting task, but what God promises to do is God promises to empower you. Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28. One of the biggest things that God tells you to do is go out and make disciples. And he tags on right there at the end, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. What God is saying there is, hey, I'm calling you to do something great that's gonna take you out of your comfort zone, but I'm going to empower you every step of the way. Because here's the truth this morning, church. The call of God on your life will never take you where the spirit of God won't empower you. And the question is not whether or not God will empower you. A lot of us say like, I don't feel empowered by the Lord. The question is never or not whether or not God will empower you. It's never in the question. What the question is for you is God's going to empower me. Am I gonna go out and do the thing that he's called me to do, that he's promised to empower me to do? So we've seen now both that God will direct his people, but also that he empowers his people. But don't forget, all of this falls under the umbrella, the context of a worldwide famine. So we're gonna see in point number three this morning also that the promise keeping God sustains. Look with me in Genesis chapter 47, verse 13. It says, now there was no food in all the land for the famine was very severe so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. What we have in the next 14 or 15 verses is a lot of detail. So I'm just gonna summarize it for you. It's still important. Joseph is the wise and discerning man, remember from last summer, that Pharaoh has placed in charge of Egypt to administrate them through the famine. So here we see Joseph actually doing it. People of Egypt come to J Joseph and they say, hey, we don't have any food. And so they give him their money and he gives them food. People of Egypt come back a little bit later. They're like, hey, we need some food, but we don't have any money. And so they give him their livestock and he gives them food. People of Egypt come back a little bit later and they're like, hey, we need some food. We don't have any money. And now we have no livestock. And so what they do is they, they say, hey, we have some land and we have ourselves. We will sell ourselves as servants in exchange for food. Joseph agrees and he says, hey, as I give you this seed, as you br bring a harvest to take care of your family, 20% comes back to Pharaoh. That is what we're missing right there in those 14 verses. But if we're gonna look at this in the context of the promise keeping God, 
for his people, when you read through those 14 verses, the question is, where are the Israelites in all of this? The text over and over and over again says, the Egyptians, the Egyptians, the Egyptians. Where are the Israelites? Look with me in verse 27 of chapter 47. It says, thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they gained possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. It is during the famine, and it is in the same context of the Egyptians struggling for food that God settles Israel in the land of Goshen, which was lush and fruitful and multiplying. Church, look at what God has done for his people. He's directed them to go to Goshen. He has provided for them. He has sustained them. He has increased them. And now he's even multiplied them. All during a worldwide famine. You as a reader of the Bible, me, we're supposed to see as we read this that all of this is God's doing. All of this is purposeful. None of this is a mistake. What we see with Jacob is if you would have asked Jacob two decades earlier, hey, how do you see God's promise kind of playing out in your life? Jacob, two decades earlier, never would have thought to mention Goshen or Egypt or Pharaoh. And the same is true in our lives. You know, God a lot of times has to change our circumstances in order to get us where he's going to sustain us. You know, the Israelites at the end of the day would have looked back and said, hey, if God would have left us in Canaan, we never would have made it. And the same is true for you. A lot of you right now, if I could talk to each and every one of you, would say, yeah, if God had left me there, I wouldn't have made it. I prayed for God to help me make it and he moved me here or he helped me do that. And we look back and we get all that faith, but then we don't use it going forward. God does something in the present. He directs us to go somewhere that we don't wanna go or he directs us to do something we don't wanna do. And immediately we're like, ah, that's a mistake. God, you're making a mistake. I don't wanna do that. I don't feel comfortable with that. But maybe that undesirable place that God wants you to go or that undesirable thing that God wants you to do is ultimately looking back 10 years down the road going to be a part of God sustaining you. One commentator summarizes this whole, everything up to this passage so well. He says, so even in Egypt, God provides a refuge for his people. He's able to sway the heart of kings. He's able to raise the humble prisoner to a position of power and might. He's able to reconcile a family. He's able to give them a land in a foreign country. And he's able to provide them food in the midst of a severe famine. And he ends it with, no other God is like the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. See, God is faithful to keep his promises. Not even a worldwide famine stands in his way. So now everything seems in place. Most sermons have three points. This one has four. When people push back on me, I was like, well, there's four things that happen. Everything seems in place, right? He's directed the people where he needed them to go. He's empowered them to do exactly what they needed him, he needed them to do. And he sustained them in exactly the same way that they needed. But here we have one fourth and final thing that happens in our passage. And that is that Jacob has one more charge or command for his son. And what we're going to see in that is point number four, the promise keeping God delivers his people. And quite simply, what we're going to see in this point is that God delivers on his promises. Look with me in chapter 47 and verse 29. It says, when the time drew near that Israel, who is Jacob, must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Here's the important part. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Remember God's promise to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 15. This is the grandfather of Jacob. And he tells him, hey, you're gonna go to Egypt. You're gonna spend a long time there. Eventually you're gonna be afflicted. But one day I'm going to bring you out of that land. I'm going to take you to the land that I promised to you. So we see throughout the Old Testament, especially throughout Genesis, the request of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the request of them to be buried with their fathers in the promised land highlights their belief that one day God is going to deliver on his promises. And this requires faith though, church. This is where the Christian life gets a little bit hard 
Because it requires faith because Jacob cannot see this happening yet. It's not like tomorrow they're moving, today he's gonna die, he knows it's gonna happen tomorrow. He cannot see down the road when God is going to deliver on his promise. And so therefore he has to have faith that God will deliver on his promise. Same goes for our lives. It is very easy for us to say, man, I love the story of Joseph. We look at the story of Joseph and the Israelites and how God eventually brings them out and takes them to the promised land. You know, when I read the story of Exodus and I read Exodus chapter one, God's people were being afflicted and they think God's forgotten them. I never sitting in my room at home get anxious because I flip two pages to the right and you can already see God beginning to bring them out. But what's hard in our lives is trusting God even when you can't see what he's doing. When you're in the middle of whatever God is doing and you can't see the end of the road. Maybe you're having trouble with your marriage right now. Maybe the word divorce has been to- tossed around a couple of times. Maybe you're having trouble at work. You have, a tough, you have a tough job, a tough boss, tough coworkers. Maybe you're a single parent and you have kids uh, and you're just trying to make ends meet. Maybe you would say, hey, my mental health is just not where it needs to be right now. See, we don't have this 30,000 foot view over our lives that we have over the Bible. But what I can encourage you with this morning, church, is that we have a book that God has given us that over and over and over again shows us that God promises to direct us and to empower us and to sustain us. And then it goes over and over and over again to prove to us that God delivers on his promises. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? With nobody looking around, I wanted to read over you one more time that verse from Joshua chapter 21. Hopefully now you see it in a new context. You see everything that has gone into the fulfillment of that verse. After all of this that Jacob and Joseph and the Israelites went through, Joshua, because of God's faithfulness, is able to put pen to paper or pen to parchment And he's able to write not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. See, this reminds us that years later, when we look back over the history of our lives, we know that God is faithful to keep his promises. And arguably the most important promise that God makes in the Bible is when in the Old Testament, he promises to one day send a Messiah, a savior to save his people from their sins. And the absolute beauty of the Bible church is that you flip over to the New Testament and you see loudly that God delivered on his promise. See, God sent his one and only son down to the earth as a human man. He lives 33 years and he never never does anything wrong. I I can barely comprehend that. And he lives all that time and yet he's still killed. And he dies a sinner's death, the death that you wholeheartedly deserve. See, the sin in your life completely separates you from God. From the moment of your first sin, you are separated from God. The Bible says you're dead in your sins. You have no shot at having a relationship with God unless God takes the initiative to have a relationship with you. When we read in the gospels and we look Jesus in the face, we see that God has taken that initiative to have a relationship with you. And this same promise-keeping God has promised to you in Romans chapter 10 and verse nine, that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you will believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you've never had the opportunity, if no one's ever told you about what it's like to have a relationship with Jesus, the majority of the people in this room would jump out of their shoes to tell you that it's the best decision that they've ever made in their life. If you've never made that kind of decision, we'd love after the service, whether it be here up at the front or out in the lobby, we'd love to have a conversation with you to help 
help you take that next step in your relationship with Jesus. For the majority of you in the room, you would say, hey, yeah, I, I have taken hold of that promise that Jesus will save me from my sins. I know Jesus, I have a relationship with him. So the question for you is you, you're leaning on the fact that God keeps his promises. You know that God has promised you that he'll direct you. The question for you is, are you listening? And are you obeying? You trust, you believe that God will empower you. The question is, are you doing as he calls? Are you stepping out in faith? You know that God promises to sustain you. Question for you is, even when you don't feel like you can make it, are you trusting that God will sustain you? Above all church, we can trust that God keeps his promises. He cares for his people. He has all power to carry out his promises. He promises to direct you, to empower you, and to ultimately sustain you. And we can rest assured that once God makes a promise to us, he will not change his mind. Let's pray. God, thank you for this opportunity to stand up here and just to talk about you, Lord, to talk about how you keep your promises to us. God, there's no better thing than to wake up in the morning to know that everything that I read in the Bible that you have promised to me, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, whether I see it now or I see it down the road, God, you will keep that promise. Pray that everyone listening this morning, Lord, that their view and their perspective of your grand design of what you're doing has broadened today. And Lord, I pray that their faith has deepened in what they know that you can do. Lord, we love you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, the way that we have faith going forward in the future, as you see in the Bible, is to look back at the times where God has kept his promises in the past. And that knowledge empowers us to move forward and to have faith in the future that he will deliver on those promises. So would you stand to your feet as we sing about the faithfulness of God to keep his promises?
let's just sing that again. There won't be a day. Cause there won't be a day that you lie by my side. And there won't be a day that you let me fall in all of my life. Your love will be true. And with all of our lives, we will worship. As I'm just standing there listening to those lyrics, I can't help but think about how that is the story of Joseph's life. That even in the pit, there was never a day that God was not faithful to him. And that is a word and an encouragement for you and I this morning. You know, this Sunday has been a Sunday of first. I don't think I've ever had the opportunity to baptize someone on their birthday. And I don't think I've ever seen a preacher have to preach through an Amber Alert that was buzzing everybody's phone in the service. So uh, great job to Austin who was powering through that the entire way. Hey, two quick things for you as we close. First thing, next Monday, July 31st, we are going to have a family night at main event. So from six to eight o'clock, we are inviting parents, we're inviting kids, we're inviting students, we're inviting empty nesters, we're inviting young singles. Anyone and everyone is invited to come and join us. We're gonna be hanging out for two hours at main event. We can give you more information about that if you come and talk to us. It's really, really cheap on Monday night, so it's an op awesome opportunity for us to celebrate the summer and look forward into the school year. And then lastly, if you didn't get a chance last week, go out to one of the tables out there, find a place that you can plug in and serve. Because God has been faithful to us, we live our response, our lives in response to him, and we are faithful back to him. So church, we love you. You are sent.